Chapter 7 The Flight from Mexico When the news came, which I have recorded, that Pedro de Alvarado was besieged and Mexico in revolt, the commands had been given to Juan Velasquez de Leon and Diego de Oda for the purpose of going to foreign settlements at Panuco and Coatzocoalcos were rescinded, and neither of them went, were all joined with us. Cortes spoke to the followers of Narve, for he felt that they would not accompany us willingly, and to induce them to give that assistance, he begged them to leave behind them their resentment over the affair of Narve, and he promised to make them rich and give them office. And as they came to seek a livelihood and were in a country where they could do service to God and His Majesty and enrich themselves, now was their chance. And so many speeches did he make to them that one and all offered themselves to him to go with us. And if they had known the power of Mexico, it is certain that not one of them would have gone. We were soon on our way by forced marches until we reached Tashkala, where we learnt that up to the time that Montezuma and his captains heard that we had defeated Narve, they did not cease to attack, and had already killed seven of Alvarado's soldiers and burnt his quarters. But as soon as they heard of our victory, they ceased attacking him. But they added that Alvarado's company were much exhausted through want of water and food, for Montezuma had failed to order food to be given to them. Some Tlaxcalan Indians brought this news at the very moment we arrived, and Cortez at once ordered a muster to be made of the men he had brought with him and found over thirteen hundred soldiers, counting both our people and the followers of Marve, and over ninety-six horses and eighty crossbowmen, and as many musketeers, and with these it seemed to Cortez that he had force enough to enter Mexico in safety. In addition to this, the caciques of Tlaxcala gave us two thousand Indian warriors, and we had once set out by forced marches to Texcoco, and they paid no honor to us there, and not a single chieftain made his appearance, for all were hidden away and ill-disposed. We arrived at Mexico on the day of Señor San Juan de Junio, 1520, and no caciques or captains or Indians whom we knew appeared in the streets and all the houses were empty when we reached the quarters where we used to lodge. The great Montezuma came out to the courtyard to embrace and speak to Cortez and bid him welcome, and congratulate him on his victory over Nave. And as Cortez was arriving victorious, he refused to listen to him, and Montezuma returned to his quarters very sad and depressed. When each one of us was lodged in the quarters he had occupied before we set out for Mexico, and the following of Narve were lodged in other quarters, we then saw and talked with Pedro de Alvarado and the soldiers who had stayed with him. They gave us an account of the attacks made on them and the straits in which the Mexicans had placed them, and we told them the story of our victory over Narve. Cortez tried to find out what was the cause of the revolt in Mexico, for we clearly understood that it was Montezuma that was made unhappy if we should think it had been his desire or had been done by his advice. Many of the soldiers who had remained with Pedro de Alvarado through that critical time said that if Montezuma had had a hand in it, all of them would have been killed. But Montezuma calmed his people until they ceased to attack. What Pedro de Alvarado told Cortes about the matter was that it was done by the Mexicans in order to liberate Montezuma, and because their Huichi Lobos ordered it, on account of our having placed the image of Our Lady, the Virgin Santa Maria, and the cross in his house. Moreover, he said that many Indians had come to remove the holy image from the altar where we placed it, and were not able to move it, and that the Indians looked upon it as a great miracle, and had said so to Montezuma, who had told them to leave it in the place and altar in which it stood, and not to attempt to do otherwise, and so it was left. Pedro de Alvarado further stated that because Narve messaged to Montezuma that he was coming to release him from prison and to capture us had not turned out to be true, and because Cortez had told Montezuma that as soon as we possessed ships, we should go and embark and leave the country entirely, and we were not going, and it was nothing but empty words, and because it was evident that many more tools were arriving, it seemed well to the Mexicans to kill him, Pedro de Alvarado, and his soldiers, and release the great Montezuma before the followers of Narve, or our own men, re-entered Mexico, and afterwards not to leave one of us or of the followers of Narve alive. Cortez turned and asked Pedro de Alvarado what was the reason that he attacked them when they were dancing and holding a festival. He replied that he knew for certain that as soon as they had finished the festivals and dances and the sacrifices that they were offering to their Huichilobos and Tezcatlipulca, that they would at once come and make an attack according to the agreement they had made between themselves. 
and this and all the rest he learned from a priest and from two chieftains and from other Mahicans. Cortez said to him, But they have told me that they asked your permission to hold festivals and dances. He replied that it was true, and it was in order to take them unprepared and to scare them, so that they should not come to attack him, that he hastened to fall on them. When Cortez heard this, he said to him very angrily that it was very ill done and a great mistake, and that he wished to God that Montezuma had escaped and not heard such an account from his idols. So he left him and spoke no more to him about it. Pedro de Alvarado himself also said that when he advanced against them in that conflict, he ordered a cannon that was loaded with one ball and many small shot to be fired, for as many squadrons of Indians were approaching to set fire to his quarters, he sallied forth to fight them, and he ordered the cannon to be fired, but it did not go off, and after he had made a charge against the squadrons which were attacking him, and many Indians were bearing down on him, while he was retreating to the fortress and quarters, then, without fire being applied to the cannon, the ball and the small shot was discharged and killed many Indians, and had it not so happened, the enemy would have killed them all, and they did on that occasion carry off two of his soldiers alive. Another thing Pedro de Alvarado stated, and this was the only thing that was also reported by the other soldiers, for the rest of the stories were told by Alvarado alone, and it is that they had no water to drink, and they dug in the courtyard and made a well and took out fresh water, all around being salt, in all it amounted to many gifts that our Lord God bestowed on us. When Cortes saw that they had given us no sort of a reception in Texcoco, and had not even given us food except bad food and with bad grace, and that we found no chieftains with whom to parley. And he saw that all were scared away and ill-disposed, and observed the same condition on coming to Mexico, how no market was held, and the whole place was in revolt. And he heard from Pedro de Alvarado about the disorderly manner in which he made his attack, and as it appears that on the march Cortes had spoken to the captains of Narve, glorifying himself in the great veneration and command that he enjoyed, and how on the road the Indians would turn out to receive him and celebrate the occasion and give him gold, and that in Mexico he ruled as absolutely over the great Montezuma as over all his captains, and that they would give him presents of gold as they were used to do, and when everything turned out contrary to his expectations, and they did not even give us food to eat, he was greatly irritated and haughty towards the numerous Spaniards that he was bringing with him, and very sad and fretful. At this moment the great Montezuma sent two of his chieftains to beg our Cortes to go and see him, for he wished to speak to him, and the answer that Cortes gave them was, Go to for a dog who will not even keep open the market, and does not order food to be given us. Then when our captains, that is, Juan Velasquez de Leon, Cristobal de Olid, Alonso de la Vira, and Francisco de Lugo heard Cortes say this, they exclaimed, Señor! Moderate your anger, and reflect how much good and honor this king of these countries has done us, who is so good that had it not been for him, we should all of us already be dead, and they would have eaten us, and remember that he has even given you his daughters. When Cortes heard this, he was more angry than ever at the words they said to him, as they seemed to be a reproof, and he said, Why should I be civil to a dog who is treating secretly with Narve? and now you can see that he does not even give us food to eat. Our captains replied, That is to our minds where he ought to do, and it is good advice, as Cortes had so many Spaniards there with him in Mexico, both of our own party and of the followers of Narve. He did not trouble himself a whit about anything, and he spoke angrily and rudely again, addressing the chieftains and telling them to say to their lord Montezuma that he should at once order the markets and sales to be held, if not, he would see what would happen. The chieftains well understood the offensive remarks that Cortes made about their lord, and even the reproof that our captains gave to Cortes about it, for they knew them well as having been those who used to be on guard over their lord, and they knew that they were good friends of their Montezuma, and according to the way they understood the matter, they repeated it to Montezuma, either from anger at this treatment, or because it had already been agreed on that we were to be attacked, it was not a quarter of an hour later that a soldier arrived in great haste and badly wounded. He came from a town close by Mexico named Tacuba, and was escorting some Indian women who belonged to Cortes, one of them a daughter of Montezuma, for it appears that Cortes had left them there in charge of the Lord of Tacuba. They were relations of this same lord when he went off on the expedition against Narvae. 
The soldiers said that all the city and road by which he had come was full of warriors, fully armed, and that they had taken from him the Indian women he was bringing, and had given him two wounds, and that if he had not let the women go, the Mexicans would have captured him, and would have put him in a canoe, and carried him off to be sacrificed, and that they had broken down a bridge. Let me go on and say that Cortez promptly ordered Diego de Orda to go with four hundred soldiers, and among them most of the crossbowmen and musketeers and some horsemen, and examine into what the soldier had reported, and that if he found that he could calm the Indians without fighting and disturbance, that he should do so. Diego de Orda set out in the way that he was ordered with his four hundred soldiers, but he had hardly reached the middle of the street along which he was to march, when so many squadrons of Mexican warriors fell on him, and so many more were on the roofs of the houses, and they made such fierce attacks that on the first assault they killed eight soldiers and wounded all the rest. And Diego de Arda himself was wounded in three places, and in this manner he could not advance one step further, but had to return little by little to his quarters. During the retreat they killed another good soldier named Liscano, who with a broadsword had done the work of a very valiant man. At that moment, while many squadrons came out against Orda, many more approached our quarters and shot off so many javelins and stones from slings and arrows that they wounded on that occasion alone over forty-six of our men, and twelve of them died of their wounds, and such a number of warriors fell upon us that Diego de Arda, who was coming in retreat, could not reach our quarters on account of the fierce assaults they made on him, some from the rear and others in front, and others from the roofs. Little availed our cannon, nor our muskets, crossbows, or lances, or the thrusts we gave them, or our good fighting, for although we killed and wounded many of them, yet they managed to reach us by pushing forward with the points of our swords and lances, and closing up their squadrons never desisted from their brave attack, nor could we push them away from us. At last, what with cannon and muskets and the damage we did them with our sword thrusts, Orda found an opportunity to enter our quarters, and... Not until then, much as he desired it, could he force a passage with his badly wounded soldiers, fourteen fewer in number. Still, many of the squadrons never ceased from attacking us and telling us that we were like women, and they called us rogues and other abusive names. But the damage they had done us up to this time was as nothing to what they did afterwards, for such was their daring that some, attacking on one side and some on the other, they penetrated into our quarters and set fire to them, and we could not endure the smoke and the fire until it was remedied by flinging much earth over it and cutting off other rooms whence the fire came. In truth, they believed that they would burn us alive in there. These conflicts lasted all day long, and even during the night so many squadrons of them fell on us and hurled javelins, stones, and arrows in masses and random stones so that what with those that fell during the day and those that then fell in all the courts and on the ground, it looked like chaff on a threshing floor. We passed the night in dressing wounds and in mending the breaches and the walls that the enemy had made and in getting ready for the next day. Then... As soon as it was dawn, our captain decided that all of us and Narvaez's men should sally out to fight with them, that we should take the cannon and muskets and crossbows and endeavor to defeat them, or at least to make them feel our strength and valor better than the day before. I may state that when we came to this decision, the Mexicans were arranging the very same thing. We fought very well, but they were so strong and had so many squadrons which relieved each other from time to time, that even if ten thousand Trojan Hectors and as many more Roldans had been there, they would not have been able to break through them. We noted their tenacity in fighting, but I declare that I do not know how to describe it, for neither cannon nor muskets nor crossbows availed, nor hand-to-hand -hand fighting, nor killing thirty or forty of them every time we charged, where they still fought on in as close ranks and with more energy than in the beginning. Sometimes, when we were gaining a little ground or part of the street, they pretended to retreat, but it was merely to induce us to follow them, and cut us off from our fortress and quarters, so as to fall on us in a greater safety to themselves. Believing that we could not return to our quarters alive, for they did us much damage when we were retreating, then, as to going out to burn their houses, I have already said that between one house and another they have wooden drawbridges, and these they raised so that we could only pass through deep water. 
Then we could not endure the rocks and stones hurled from the roofs in such a way that they damaged and wounded many of our men. I do not know why I write thus so lukewarmly, for some three or four soldiers who were there with us and who had served in Italy swore to God many times that they had never seen such fierce fights, nor even when they had taken part in such between Christians and against the artillery of the King of France or of the Great Turk, nor had they seen men like those Indians with such courage in closing up their ranks. With great difficulty we withdrew to our quarters, many squadrons of warriors still pressing on us with loud yells and whistles and trumpets and drums, calling us villains and cowards who did not dare to meet them all day in battle, but turned in flight. On that day they killed ten or twelve more soldiers, and we all returned badly wounded. What took place during the night was the arrangement that in two days' time all the soldiers in camp, as many as were able, should sally out with four engines like towers built of strong timber, in such a manner that five and twenty men could find shelter under each of them, and they were provided with apertures and loopholes through which to shoot, and musketeers and crossbowmen accompanied them, and close by them were to march the other soldiers, musketeers and crossbowmen, and the guns, and all the rest, and the horsemen were to make charges. When this plan was settled, as we spent all that day in carrying out the work, and in strengthening many breaches that they had made in the walls, we did not go out to fight. I do not know how to tell of the great squadrons of warriors who came to attack us that day in our quarters. Not only in ten or twelve places, but in more than twenty. For we were distributed over them all and in many other places, and while we built up and fortified ourselves, as I have related, many other squadrons openly endeavored to penetrate into our quarters, and neither with guns, crossbows, nor muskets, nor with many charges and short sword thrusts could we force them back. For they said that not one of us should remain alive that day, and they would sacrifice our hearts and blood to their gods, and would have enough to glut their appetites and hold feasts on our arms and legs, and would throw our bodies to the tigers, lions, vipers, and snakes, which they kept caged, so that they might gorge on them. And for that reason they had ordered them not to be given food for the past two days. As for the gold we possessed, we would get little satisfaction from it, or from all the cloths. And as for the flesh collins who were with us, they had said that they would place them in cages to fatten, and little by little they would offer their bodies in sacrifice. And very tenderly they said that we should give up to them their great lord Montezuma, and they said other things, night by night, in like manner. There were always many yells and whistles and showers of darts, stones, and arrows. As soon as dawn came, after commending ourselves to God, we sallied out from our quarters with our towers, with the cannon muskets and crossbows in advance, and the horsemen making charges. But, as I have stated, although we killed many of them, it availed nothing towards making them turn their backs. Indeed, if they had fought bravely on the two previous days, they proved themselves far more vigorous, and displayed much greater forces and squadrons on this day. Nevertheless... We determined, although it should cost the lives of all of us, to push on with our towers and engines as far as the great queue of Wichilobos. I will not relate at length the fights we had with them in a fortified house, nor will I tell how they wounded the horses, nor were the horses of any use to us, because although the horsemen charged the squadrons to break through them, so many arrows, darts, and stones were hurled at them that they, well protected by armor though they were, could not prevail against the enemy. And if they pursued and overtook them, the Mahicans promptly dropped for safety into the canals and lagoons, where they had raised other walls against the horses, and many other Indians were stationed with very long lances to finish killing them. Thus it benefited us nothing to turn aside to burn or demolish a house. It was quite useless, for as I have said, they all stood in the water, and between house and house there was a movable bridge, and to cross by swimming was very dangerous, for on the roofs they had such store of rocks and stones and such defenses that it was certain destruction to risk it. In addition to this, where we did set fire to some houses, a single house took a whole day to burn, and the houses did not catch fire one from the other. Thus it was useless toil to risk our persons in the attempt. So we went towards the great queue of the idols. Then... All of a sudden, more than four thousand Mahicans ascended it, not counting other companies that were posted on it with long lances and stones and darts, and placed themselves on the defensive, and resisted our ascent for a good while, 
and neither the towers, nor the cannon, nor crossbows, nor the muskets were of any avail, nor the horsemen, for although they wished to charge, the whole of the courtyard was paved with very large flagstones, so that the horses lost their foothold, and the stones were so slippery that the horses fell, while from the steps of the lofty queue they forbade our advance. We had so many enemies both on one side and the other that although our cannon shots carried off ten or fifteen of them, and we slew many others by sword thrusts and charges. So many men attacked us that we were not able to ascend the lofty queue. However, with great unanimity, we persisted in the attack, and without taking the towers, for they were already destroyed, we made our way to the summit. Here Cortez showed himself very much of a man, as he always was. Oh, what a fight, and what a fierce battle it was that took place. It was a memorable thing to see us all streaming with blood and covered with wounds and others slain. It pleased our Lord that we reached the place where we used to keep the image of Our Lady, and we did not find it. And it appears, as we came to know, that the great Montezuma paid devotion to her and ordered the image to be preserved in safety. We set fire to their idols in a good part of the chamber where the idols which Lobos and Tezcatabuc were burned. On that occasion, the Tlaxcalans helped us very greatly. After this was accomplished, while some of us were fighting and others kindling the fire, as I have related, oh, to see the priests who were stationed on this great queue, and the three or four thousand Indians, all men of importance, while we descended, oh, how they made us tumble down six or even ten steps at a time, and so much more there is to tell of the other squadrons posted on the battlements and recesses of the great queue, discharging so many darts and arrows, that we could face neither one group of squadrons nor the other. We resolved to return with much toil and risk to ourselves, to our quarters, our castles being destroyed, all of us wounded and sixteen slain, with the Indians constantly pressing on us and other squadrons on our planks. However clearly I may tell all this, I can never fully explain it to anyone who did not see us, so far, I have not spoken of what the Mexican squadrons did, who kept on attacking our quarters while we were marching outside, and the great obstinacy and tenacity they displayed in forcing their way in. In this battle, we captured two of the chief priests, whom Cortez ordered us to convey with great care. Many times I have seen among the Mexicans and Tlaxcalans paintings of this battle, and the ascent that we made of the great queue as they look upon it as a very heroic deed, and although in the pictures that they have made of it, they depict all of us badly wounded and streaming with blood, and many of us dead. They considered it a great feat, this setting fire to the queue, when so many warriors were guarding it both on the battlements and recesses, and many more Indians were below on the ground, and the courts were full of them, and there were many more on the sides. And with our towers destroyed, how was it possible to scale it? Let us stop talking about it, and I will relate how, with great labor, we returned to our quarters and if many men were then following us, as many more were in our quarters, for they had already demolished some walls so as to gain an entry, but on our arrival they desisted. Nevertheless, during all the rest of the day they never ceased to discharge darts, stones, and arrows, and during the night yells and stones and darts. That night was passed in dressing wounds and in burying the dead, in preparations for going out to fight the following day in strengthening and adding parapets to the walls they had pulled down, and to other breaches they had made, and in consulting how and in what way we could fight without suffering such great damage and death, and throughout the discussion we found no remedy at all. Then I also wish to speak of the maledictions that the followers of Narvé hurled at Cortez, and the words that they used cursing him in the country, and even Diego Velázquez, who had sent them there when they were peacefully settled in their homes on the island of Cuba, and they were crazy and out of their minds. Let us go back to our story. It was decided to sue for peace, so that we could leave Mexico, and as soon as it was dawn, many more squadrons of Mexicans arrived and very effectually surrounded our quarters on all sides, and if they had discharged many stones and arrows before, they came much thicker and with louder howls and whistles on this day, and other squadrons endeavored to force an entrance in other parts, and cannon and muskets availed nothing, although we did them damage enough. When Cortez saw all this, he decided that the great Montezuma should speak to them from the roof and tell them that the war must cease and that we wished to leave his city. When they went to give this message from Cortez to the great Montezuma, it is reported that he said, with great grief, 
What more does Malinche want from me? I neither wish to live nor to listen to him, to such a pass as my fate brought me because of him. And he did not wish to come and it is even reported that he said he neither wished to see nor hear him, nor listen to his false words, promises, or lies. Then the Padre de la Merced and Cristobal de Olid went and spoke to him with much reverence and in very affectionate terms, and Montezuma said, I believe that I shall not obtain any results towards ending this war, for they have already praised up another lord and made up their minds not to let you leave this place alive. Therefore, I believe that all you will have to die. Montezuma was placed by a battlement of the roof, with many of his soldiers guarding him. They began to speak to his people with very affectionate expressions, telling them to desist from the war and that we would leave Mexico. Many of the Mexican chieftains and captains knew him well and at once ordered their people to be silent and not to discharge darts, stones, or arrows, and four of them reached a spot where Montezuma could speak to them, and they to him, and with tears they said to him, O oh, Signor and our great Lord, how all your misfortune and injury and that of your children and relations afflicts us. We make known to you that we have already raised one of your kinsmen to be our Lord. And there he stated his name, that he was called Quitlawak, the Lord of Ishtapalapa. And moreover, they said that the war must be carried through, and that they had vowed their idols not to relax until we were all dead, and that they prayed every day to their Huichilobos and Texcatepuca to guard them from, or guard him free and safe from our power, and that should it end as they desired, they would not fail to hold him in higher regard as the Lord than they did before, and they begged him to forgive them. They had hardly finished this speech when suddenly such a shower of stones and darts were discharged that our men who were shielding him, having neglected for a moment their duty because they saw how the attack ceased while he spoke to them, he was hit by three stones, one on the head, another on the arm, and another on the leg. And although they begged him to have the wounds dressed and to take food and spoke kind words to him about it, he would not. Indeed, when we least expected it, they came to say that he was dead. Cortez wept for him, and all of us captains and soldiers, and there was no man among us who knew him and was intimate with him, who did not bemoan him as though he were our father, and it is not to be wondered at, considering how good he was. It was stated that he had reigned for seventeen years, and that he was the best king there had ever been in Mexico, and that he had conquered in person, in three wars which he had carried on in the countries he had subjugated. I have already told about the sorrow that we all of us felt about it when we saw that Montezuma was dead. We even thought badly of the Frail de la Merced because he had not persuaded him to become a Christian, and he gave us an excuse that he did not think that he would die of those wounds, but that he ought to have ordered them to give him something to, stu to stupefy him. At the end of much discussion, Cortez ordered a priest and a chief from among the prisoners to go and tell the cacique whom they had chosen for lord who was named Quitlawak, and his captains, that the great Montezuma was dead, and they had seen him die, and about the manner of his death and the wounds his own people had inflicted on him, and they should say how grieved we all were about it, and that they should bury him as the great king that he was, and they should raise the cousin of Montezuma who was with us to be their king, for the inheritance was his, or one of Montezuma's other sons, and that he whom they had raised to be king was not so by right, and they should negotiate a peace so that we could leave Mexico. And if they did not do so, now that Montezuma was dead, whom we held in respect, and for that reason we had not destroyed their city, we should sally out to make war on them and burn all their houses and do them much damage. So as to convince them that Montezuma was dead, he ordered six Mexicans who were high chieftains and the priests whom we held as prisoners to carry him out on their shoulders and to hand the body over to the Mexican captains and to tell them that Montezuma had commanded at the time of his death, for those who carried him out on their backs were present at his death, and they told Quitlawak the whole truth, how his own people killed him with blows from three stones. When they beheld him thus dead, we saw that they were in floods of tears, and we clearly heard the shrieks and cries of distress that they gave for him. But 
for all this, the fierce assault they made on us never ceased. And then they came to us again with greater force and fury, and said to us, Now for certain you will pay for the death of our king and lord, and the dishonor to our idols, and as for the peace you sent to beg for, come out here and we will settle how and in what way it is to be made. And they said that they had already chosen a good king, and he would not be so faint-hearted as to be deceived with false speeches like their good Montezuma. And as for the burial, we know not trouble about that, but about our own lives, for in two days they would not be one of us left, so much for the messages we had sent them. With these words they fell on us with loud yells and whistles, and showers of stones and darts and arrows, while other squadrons were still attempting to set fire to our quarters in many places. When Cortez and all of us observed this, we agreed that next day we would all of us sally out from our camp and attack in another direction, where there were many houses on dry land, and we would do all the damage we were able, and go the causeway, and that all the horsemen should break through the squadrons and spear them with their lances, or drive them into the water, even though the enemy should kill the horses. This was decided on in order to find out if by chance, with the damage and slaughter that we should inflict on them, they would abandon their attack and arrange some sort of peace, so we could go free without more deaths and damage. Although the next day we all bore ourselves very manfully and killed many of the enemy and burned a matter of twenty houses and almost reached dry land, it was all of no use because of the great damage and deaths and wounds they inflicted on us, and we could not hold a single bridge, for they were all of them half broken down. Many Mexicans charged down on us, and they had set up walls and barricades in places which they thought could be reached by the horses, so that if we had met with many difficulties up to this time, we found much greater ones ahead of us. Now we saw our forces diminishing every day, and those of the Mexicans increasing, and many of our men were dead and all the rest wounded, and although we felt like brave men, we could not drive back nor even get free from the many squadrons which attacked us both by day and night, and the powder was giving out, and the same was happening with the food and water. And the great Montezuma being dead, they were unwilling to grant for peace and truce, which we had sent to demand of them. In fact, we were staring death in the face, and the bridges had been raised. It was therefore decided by Cortez and all of his captains and soldiers that we should set out during the night. That very afternoon we sent to tell them, through one of their priests, whom we held prisoner, and who was a man of great importance among them, that they should let us go in peace within eight days, and we would give up to them all the gold, and this was done to put them off their guard, so we might get out of the night. 